So what is technology? It's an extension of man, a facilitator of life, all very true and very inspirational comments. Uh, now, after reading much of the literature, I worked out a little working definition for you. It consists of four parts and hopefully makes it a little bit more concrete on what technology actually is. It goes like this. Technology consists of standardized solutions that address typical needs. It's derived from knowledge about the world, which is embedded in a physical structure. So let's go about these four one by one. I'll start with the first one. Technology addresses a typical need. Uh, let's start with a very tangible technology. Digital technologies are sometimes not so tangible. So let's start with a dishwasher. Now, what is the typical need addressed by the dishwasher? Well, obviously, it washes the dishes. Um, what about the car? Also technology. What is the typical need addressed by the car? Obviously, as well, it helps us to go from A to B. Um, let's go to some ICT. What is the typical need addressed by a mobile phone? It helps us to communicate over a distance to telecommunicate. Tele means distance in Greek. Telecommunicate while we are mobile. Mobile telecommunication. That's actually the official name of this kind of technology. Now, we also all know that technology is evolving and we have much to say about that later. Um, basically, what that reflects as well is that our typical needs seem to evolve. Now, do our typical needs evolve? Uh, didn't we always have the need for the latest smartphone? Why did we start with the iPhone 3? Well, that has to do with the possibilities to address typical needs. It was simply impossible to have the latest iPhone before we had the iPhone 3. And as the seminal science fiction writer Arthur Clarke tells us if we try to imagine new technologies, we have to venture a little bit beyond the possible and into the impossible. Arthur Clarke has three laws uh, to profile the future and two of them consist in the fact that the only way of dis uh, discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible. And the other law is that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Now think about it. If you would have pulled out your latest mobile phone only 50 years ago, people would have said, magic. Imagine 500 years ago. So any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And that's why also many technologies are often derived from the imagination of science fiction writers who venture into the impossible. The very same Arthur Clarke proposed in 1945 some rocket stations that would give worldwide radio coverage. Nowadays we call them satellites. And the orbit on where satellites circle around the Earth is called the Clark orbit. He's a science fiction writer. As uh, well, something very similar happened with another seminal science fiction writer, Asimov, and the invention of industrial robotics. So the inventors of industrial of the first industrial robots inspired themselves from the writing of Asimov. So this is one thing. Um, technology is path dependent, we have to build on one and then after the other. And this way we also have to venture all the time a little bit into the impossible from the possible right now into the impossible. This is one thing of how we can address typical needs. The other thing is that sometimes um, we just get stuck with the way we address a typical need. And it's not so much that it's impossible to address this typical need need differently, it has rather to do with that we are used to address this typical need in a way we do. We are locked into this path dependency. Check out this proposal here by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation of how to readdress a very typical need that humankind is having. 
Furthermore, technology is derived from knowledge about the world. So what is knowledge? I'll give you another working definition. Knowledge basically consists of algorithms. Great, now we replace the very ill-defined word knowledge with a very well-defined word, but what does it mean? What is an algorithm? Okay, here we go. An algorithm is an ordered set of unambiguous executable steps that defines a terminating process. All right, um, for example, a cooking recipe. Cooking recipe is an ordered set of unambiguous the good ones, executable steps, yes, that define a terminating process. Okay, at the end you have a cake. So a cooking recipe is basically an algorithm and uh, a very casual way of describing an algorithm is just saying an algorithm is a recipe. You can usually replace the word algorithm with recipe and it will work. Now, the world is full of algorithms of recipes. So these algorithms, they don't have anything to do with a machine or with a computer or with a software program. There are recipes that help us to navigate life. We teach each other algorithms in our work routine. You do this or that. Or your coach teaches you algorithms when you play sports. You run ahead and when the other team is starting to attack, you go back and at the end it's a terminating process. The ball has to go into the net. So these are all algorithms. This is knowledge. This is an ordered set of unambiguous executable steps. A, then B, then C, then D. And if, if C is equal to that, then this. And if this is equal to that, then that, this is algorithms. If, then, if, then, then goes the next one. So this is what algorithms consist of. Now the idea is once we have algorithms, once we have knowledge, we can embed them into physical structures and create technologies with them. But for that, first of all, we have to understand what this algorithm consists of, this algorithm that addresses a typical need. For example, they once asked John van Neumann, a foundational, very important computer scientist, a co-inventor of what we nowadays call uh, a computer. They asked him, a machine cannot think, can it? And his answer was, worrying about what a machine cannot do is the right way. Once you tell me exactly what it is a machine cannot do, I can build a machine that can exactly do what you described. What he's saying is, once you give me the algorithm, if you exactly tell me what you do when you think, you do this and then you do that. And if this, then you do that. And if this, then you do that. Then I can build a machine that thinks. The problem is we don't actually know what we do when we think. The technical term for that is that our knowledge is tacit. So there is tacit, implicit knowledge, and there is explicit knowledge. Knowledge is explicit once we do have the complete algorithm. It's kind of like fighting karate. So you can learn fighting karate from a master, for example, from Mr. Minyagi, and he just shows you how to move and he lets you repeat. And you do learning by doing and learning by doing. And probably not even Mr. Minyagi could tell you in all the details, look, if you move it like this, then you move your arm like that, and then you move exactly this part of your arm like this, he probably won't know himself in such a detail. Um, he just lets you observe for months, for years, and you practice, and then we have this knowledge, but it's tacit. We do not exactly have the algorithm. Now, to say it in the words of John von Neumann, once you tell me exactly what it is, what you do when you fight karate, we can build a machine that can exactly do what you described. There comes the idea that, for example, when you're in the matrix, you can just download the explicit algorithm of how to fight karate and Afterwards, you can straight up beat the best karate fighter in the world because karate is kind of like solved. We have the algorithm. Now, once we have the algorithm, the idea is we can embed it into a physical structure and everybody can benefit from it. It's explicit knowledge. So that's the distinction between tacit knowledge, 
implicit knowledge and explicit knowledge where we know the exact algorithm. Once we have an algorithm, an explicit algorithm, we can take it and embed it into a physical structure. This is usually the task of engineers. They take algorithms, knowledge derived from the world, and look for a physical structure into which to best embed it. And the benefit is that once it is in this physical structure, we don't have to execute these algorithms by ourselves anymore. We let the embedded physical automation execute the algorithm for us. With the result that often we don't even know how it works ourselves. For example, do you know how to calculate the square root of a number? Of course, not by using the calculator, uh, but by hand. So here is Newton's 17th century algorithm to calculate the square root. Um, he says basically you take the number that you have you divide it by an estimator, you add this estimator, and then you multiply it by half. So uh, let's go through it. Uh, let's calculate the square root of 2. Uh, and then we start with an estimator. Let's say the square root of 2, we estimate that the square root of 2 is 1. But you can be completely off with your estimate. It doesn't really, really matter. I think the square root of 2 is something with something with uh, 1.4 something. Right? Does that sound about right? Okay. So you take the number 2, you divide it by 1 and add 1, that gives 3, and then you multiply it by half, gives, gives 1.5. 3 divided by 2, right? Now 1.5 is our new estimate. So we take 2 divided by 1.5 plus 1.5, this entire thing divided by 2, multiplied by a half, it gives 1.4167 and now we take this as our estimate and we continue and we get very very close to the real square root of a 2. Now once we have this algorithm, once Newton figured it out, now we can take it and embed it into a physical structure. For example, one of the first calculators, uh, computers actually, Leibniz built was made out of wood. And these modern calculators, uh, something very similar, they just don't use wood. Uh, the modern ones use silicon, but this knowledge is kind of like embedded into their guts, you might almost say, be it in the cable or in general purpose computers, into the software structure, which is also physical. But you don't need silicon to calculate. You can take this kind of algorithm and embed it into all kind of structure. For example, check out Jay. He used Tinker Toys to embed the knowledge of calculation. My basic message here is that you have a choice in which kind of physical structure to embed this knowledge with. And sometimes there is no optimal structures and engineers also work with these kind of trade-offs. Even for computation as well, you can compu compute with wood, with tinker toys. You do not need silicon to compute. For example, Len Edelman, a computer scientist professor at USC, one of the most interesting people I had the honor of studying with, he once took that also literally and said, well, if we can compute with everything, then we should be able to compute with biological matter, like macromolecules, like DNA. So he took a typical need, of a mathematical problem called the traveling salesman problem, and he used DNA to solve this problem for him. He computed with DNA. That was the invention of the DNA computer. I mean, we know that biology computes. I, I mean, we hope so. I mean, for some of us, it hopefully, well, yes. Um, but now we can also then use these kind of structures to, to solve completely unrelated problems. And that is the basic takeaway, that you embed the knowledge in a physical structure but there is a choice of which kind of physical structure you choose. And last but not least, technologies are standardized solution. They follow a different standard which determines actually what is this technology. This can be, for example, that usually referred to as a car of having four wheels. If it would have two wheels, we might call it a motorcycle. And if it might have three wheels, we might. So there is some kind of standard to it. I already mentioned the standard of 
the toilet that uh, defines actually what we think of as a toilet is. Usually we think of it has to do with water and canalization. Doesn't have to, but would that then still be a toilet? Well, so there's a certain standard to that is what people call a dominant design. Sometimes standards can also be a little bit more technical. They really define not only what we understand the technology to be, but they also make it interoperable with other technologies. They help us also to get used to using this technology. For example, you might be familiar with the QWERTY keyboard. That's a standard. The way your keyboard on your computer is organized follows a standard. So it's called QWERTY because the first letters on the top left, they spell QWERTY. Now the reason why we have a QWERTY keyboard is not because it is the most efficient keyboard around. There was another design called DSK and it lets you type 20 to 40 percent faster. But we standardize kind of like on the wrong system. We choose a layout of the keyboard that's 20 to 40 percent less efficient. Considering how much we type every day, that's actually a shame. How did that happen? What happened by actually kind of like an accident, a historical accident, the layout of the QWERTY keyboard is because salespeople, they walked around with a typewriter in one hand, back in the days was typewriter, and then they rang the doorbell of different houses, they presented them this new fancy machine, and since they had the typewriter in one hand, they had only one other hand to type, and you can spell the word typewriter completely in the first line of the letters check it out on your keyboard. So they were here writing typewriter C, what a great machine, you want to buy that? It works, typewriter, that's what it's called. So it's basically a, a historical accident that, that, that happened. It doesn't have anything to do with looking for the most efficient design. Sometimes these frozen accidents that set the future standard can also be a strategic business alliance or the decision of an individual or the accident of an individual. A very famous example of where one decision had a huge large term effect is the decision of IBM to adopt Microsoft's operating system on their hardware machines with the result that Windows has nowadays a very dominant position among the computer computer operating system. So this was a basic decision between two companies, IBM and Microsoft, with very long-term effects. And with that, Windows also set the standards of what we understand an operating system to be. Oof, that was a lot. Okay, so wait, so what is technology? Well, technology are standardized solutions to address typical needs. They're derived from knowledge about the world and embedded into a physical structure. 